peace of the risen Lord be with you this morning. We start our service this morning and we sing together from our screen, O oh, love that will not let me go, I rest my weary soul in thee. Lord Jesus, you are the vine, and we are the branches in your vineyard. As the shepherd from, from the vine is black, so do we as a church from you. Prune away, we pray, those parts of our lives which hamper our growth in your vineyard. Prune away the conflict within us. That rejects your peace. Prune away the despair and hopelessness which COVID has engendered in so many lives. Prune away the difference which allows injustice to continue in our society. Nurture in us that free flow of your Holy Spirit, which will cause your church, your vineyard, to produce much fruit. Spirit. Enable us to be a 
and our worship may we connect more deeply each week to you the true vine and experience your life-giving sap so strengthened may we by word and deed bring deep peace new hope and a strong sense of justice into our worshiping community and into the communities we serve so shall we join together in saying the lord's prayer our father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive them that trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for the mind is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever So we come to our, our second hymn, More Love, More Power.
the theme from the dictionary readings today is very much about love. And our reading comes from John's letter, uh, 1 John 4, 7 to 21. Dear friends, let us love one another because love comes from God. Whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. And God showed his love for us by sending his only son into the world so that we might have life through him. This is what love is. It is not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the means by which our sins are forgiven. Dear friends, if this is how God loved us, then we should love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in union with us, and his love is made perfect in us. We are sure that we live in union with God, and that he lives in union with us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and tell others that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone declares that Jesus is the Son of God, he lives in union with God, and God lives in union with him. And we ourselves know and believe the love which God has for us. God is love, and those who live in love live in union with God, and God lives in union with them. Love is made perfect in us in order that we may have courage on Judgment Day. And we will have it because our life in this world is the same as Christ's. There is no fear in love. Perfect love drives out all fear. So then, love has not been made perfect in anyone who is afraid. Because fear has to do with punishment. We love because God first loved us. If we say we love God but hate our brothers and sisters, we are liars. For people cannot love God whom they have not seen if they do not love their brothers and sisters whom they have seen. The command that Christ has given us is this, all who love God must love their brother or sister also. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. Come, let us pray. May the words of my mouth, O God, and the meditations of our hearts, may they be pleasing in your sight. You, O God, who has always been our rock and our redeemer. In Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, I had a title by being this morning, Union with God. I think there are moments that that I'm baffled by the idea that union with God in essence means that God stays with me. And sometimes I think, am I worthy? Am I worthy for God to stay with me? And sometimes that worthiness that I that I allow to question myself, um, particularly this week, um, a week where I'm angry and, and I hear that that's not really what I should be. And then I think, you know what, I wonder, I 
and they find space with God. And then I hear this kind of union conversation that it's not so much about me and how I respond, but it's about the initiation that, that God takes on my behalf. And then I thought for a brief moment about the movie called Shrek. Do you know the movie Shrek? And so you will understand that in the movie Shrek, there's this, um, what's his name? Ogre. So there's Ogre and there's Fiona. And whilst Ogre thinks that he is in love with Fiona, Fiona truly sits with the deep secret. And the deep secret is before Ogre could even love Fiona, it's Fiona that actually loves Ogre before anything else. And so I think that's the, the same essence that God can look at all of our ugliness and all of our shortcomings and all of our per pervasiveness and still fall madly in love with who and what we are. Because we are what God has created. And so when the text opens, the text opens for us this morning and says that union or that friendship with God is because the love, the, the, the love comes from God. It's an extension from God to us. And that changes my whole concept of whether I'm worthy. Because then I must think, there must be something in me that God sees. And even if no one else sees it, I think I'm quite chuffed that God finds me worthy. And particularly worthy that he would give Jesus Christ as a ransom for me. An exchange. An exchange when I go through moments where I should have lots of ordeals in the same ways what Jesus says, that I can know that Jesus takes that upon himself and allows me the liberty to live in the grace of, of God. And, and so this morning, as we, as we understand that union, hear what the text says. The text says, whoever loves is a child of God and knows God. And so union with God is precisely about relationship with God. It's almost as if the story of the vine and the branches comes to life, isn't it? It's that if you remain in me and I remain in you, and, and there needs to be this connection. So I don't know, this week I, I was going through what's happening in the house and I realized that I had just put into the kitchen new plugs on the wall in January. And so last night I wanted to make myself a cuppa and I realized the kettle's not working. And I plugged the kettle and I thought, I just bought this thing. Opened the plug, nothing wrong with the plug. And then I thought, oh my good, I just hope I didn't throw that box away. And then I thought for a moment, what if it's not the kettle at all? And then I went to the plug and realized it's the plug. The plug had just burnt the actual socket in the wall. And so maybe, maybe there's this understanding that we can't create the energy that we need to have when, when we're plugging into is not switched on. Bad analogy, but wanting for us to understand that the essence of our love for God is that we need to be connected to God. There needs to be a spark there. I think no relationship works when there's no connection. Isn't that so? And so maybe this morning for us to ask ourselves the question whether we have union with God and if that union is existing through the power of our relationship with God. And relationship with God must undoubtedly mean that we need to work it. And yet when we listen to the scripture, the scripture says it's not so much what you do. It's all about what God can do for you. And so this morning, I'm wondering whether 
we can fathom how much God does for us and how little we actually need to do. And the only thing that we need to do is simply this, as for the text, to believe in Jesus. And that's a, that's, that sounds easy, and yet it's hard. I found that particularly hard this week um, as I went through my own emotions and thinking, I believe in Jesus. And then as I journal my experiences this week, I'm realizing that, you know, in the midst of all of that, of my experiences this week, I can believe in Jesus. As I came across a little, a little thing that I found in my journal on Friday morning, and the writing says, I might not have roses, but I can never forget who walked the twain. Jesus crowned thorns, the roses that I want. And yet, it's Jesus that really takes the pain away in our lives. And that makes a huge difference um, in terms of who and what our relationship is. And then the text says, and God showed his love. And so let's speak about union that's not just about words and about externals, but a deep internal experience that says, let me, let me show you how sacrificial this is. Let me show you what this can mean, because this means I, 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 I go to whatever length I need to go to ensure that you know that you are loved. And the length that God goes through is that he gives us Jesus. He gives us Jesus to bring all of us back into his fold. It's, it's, it's a wonderful experience. It's a wonderful experience to know that in our garden of life, there is a gardener that often prunes and must prune. Because if the gardener doesn't prune, then it simply means that we're not in a space where we are in relationship. When you, when you are in relationship with someone, I think the best form to know that you are in relationship with someone is when you ruffle feathers. Have you, have you noticed that? The minute you begin to, if it's all smooth sailing, you smile at whatever one another says, it's not a true relationship. But when you begin to say, you really annoy me. But in the midst of you annoying me, um, I still love you. And I still choose to be with you. I think that's particularly apt for couples. When you think, you know, must you now really do that? And you think, but you know what, I choose to be with you. And I think that's exactly the expressions that God has. I think sometimes God looks at us brilliant, and thinks, what? And then God says, but I still choose to be your friend. And I still choose to be in conversation with you. And so as we continue to be in conversation with us, that union says, it's something that, that love perfects. So let's think about that kind of perfection as we, as we grow in relationship with one another. Do you know that when we meet someone initially, we are irritated by what they do? Is, is that true for you? That's true for me. But as the time goes, we are less irritated by one another. And I don't know whether we call that tolerance. I don't know whether it's tolerance that meet us to that that helps us to get to that place where we don't fret the little things any longer. I think in relationship. Um, so if I have to ask Mary, Mary, what is it that annoys you about your partner? then there's something peculiar that can still annoy you to this day. But at the heart of it all, you still choose to be with that partner. Isn't that so? It's that perfection that, that, that... So as Tony and I get to know each other more, there's stuff about me that initially would have irritated Tony, but now it's okay. He can deal with that. And I think that's precisely what, what this story begins to tell us about our relationship with God, that, that, that God just continues to perfect it. 
And so when we perfect, it simply gets to this point in conversation. It's about trying again. So anybody here that's a great baker? So Jill, your baking didn't start because you were professional about it. It started precisely because you made your first flop. Or did it just happen? And I think when you make that first flop, you think, now what did I do? What in this recipe did I not follow to precision? And you do it again and again and again. And so reminds me this morning that there are deep moments that my recipe doesn't come out very well, my life recipe. But I can't say, you know, um, I'm just going to give up. It's like I, I don't really know how to cook. And I've told myself I'm never going to do that. And so speaking to Joan yesterday, she says to me, I will teach you. So friends, my teacher has lots to do with me. And I think in the same way, in the same way, God has that opportunity through the incarnation of Jesus that allows us to, to go through experiences. And in those experiences, they are really teaching moments. And depending what we take out of our, out of our teaching moments, we'll speak about who and what we become. So when we listen to that, and we think, you know what, sometimes it's really difficult to do that stuff. Then I hear in this portion of scripture, that this portion of scripture says, do you know what? You don't have to do it by yourself. And you don't have to struggle by your own. I too will give you a teacher. I will create for you a job who will perfect in you your art. And you know what that teacher is called? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit and often is that still quiet voice that just speaks to us in a profound way and says to us, love God. But I think that quiet voice of the Spirit of God is the moment when we tune in. Do you remember the gramophone? <clears throat> the thing about the gramophone is that the gramophone, particularly when you live on a farm, has a lot of <sighs> and you constantly need to tune in. And there's never a moment on the gramophone that you were just sitting on 94.7. There was no set frequency. You constantly needed to turn. And I think the gift of the Spirit of God in union with God allows us to say, you know what, I'm just slightly out of frequency. I'm out of tune. And then moments like this morning, a moment when we meet at the Lord's table allows us again and again to be tuned in by the simple things and the soft voices of no words. No words. But simply an outward sign of a deep inward expression. So this morning, when you come to the Holy Communion table, come and kneel. Spend some time and discover for yourself what is it when bread is placed in your hand, when the brokenness of Christ is just placed there. What does the Spirit of God say to you about your union with God? And when you receive the wine, the fruit of the vine, what does that mean in relation to the forgiveness of Christ? Those still quiet moments when we are drawn into fellowship with God again. And maybe it's not only this moment. Maybe it's the moment when you sit in the bosque of the sun during a, a winter's morning and you just sit there quietly. And you look through the window and your eyes gaze on the marvel of a beautiful God. 
those moments, those moments when God uses whatever at his disposal to connect with each one of us. And when God connects with each one of us in that way, it brings us to a space where we can undoubtedly say, you know what? I don't have to fear God. I don't have to say, you know, I'm not worthy. I can walk for with boldness. Do you remember a character that had to walk with boldness, even though the character in the Bible knew what could happen without an appointment? Do you remember that character? That character walks in, and that character says, you know what? He will hold up the scepter and invite me. That's boldness. To approach the throne with boldness and not to think, you know what, I've got all these shortcomings. Stop fretting about that. Make your confessions and make right with one another and with God and move on. Don't hold on to it forever. I think it's a, it's a beautiful thing. It's a beautiful thing to know that we can come with such boldness and that when we fear, then we have not adequately grasped the love of God for us. I think sometimes when I was growing old, there were moments that I would be very afraid to ask my dad something. And so in being afraid to ask my dad something, I always wanted to drive his car. So I took his key. And I drove it. It was on a farm. And I drove it right into a ditch. It took two tractors to pull it out. And dad simply said to me, why didn't you ask me to teach you how to drive? And I looked at him and I said, Dad, I was so afraid. And Dad answered and said, there was no need. I would have shown you how to drive. And so in my life learning, I move out of that and I think to myself, maybe sometimes I lose opportunity because I'm too afraid. I'm too afraid. And so this morning, I'm inviting you to put your fear aside and to say, you know what, I'm going to step up in boldness and I'm going to have a conversation with God. And I'm going to know that the word of God says, what you ask in my name, if you believe, you will receive. May this morning's Holy Communion be a moment where your fears are put aside and your boldness is brought to life. In Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> Friends, we sing the chorus, Break Thou the Bread of Life, dear Lord, to me.
Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father God, it is indeed right, it is our joy and our salvation to give you thanks and praise through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. You created all things and made us in your own image. When we had fallen into sin, you gave your only Son to be our Saviour. And so with all the company of heaven, we join in the unending hymn of praise. Amen. 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 God, power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. O Son and Christ, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. O Son and Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and he gave thanks. He broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this and eat it. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and gave thanks, saying to them, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in remembrance of me. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. Therefore, Father, as he has commanded us, we will do this in remembrance of him and ask you to accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, drawn that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we who receive your gifts of bread and wine may share in the body and blood of Christ. Make us one body with you. Accept us as we offer ourselves to be a living sacrifice and bring us with the whole creation to your heavenly kingdom. We ask this through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The bread we break is a sharing in the body of Christ. Because we all share in the one word. We say the prayer of humble access together. Lord, we come to your table, trusting in your mercy and not in any goodness of our own. We are not worthy even to gather up the crumbs under your table, but it is your nature always to have mercy. And on that we so feed us with the body and blood of Jesus Christ, your Son, that we may forever live in Him and He in us. Amen. The body of Christ, broken for you, taken and eat, remember Him in the heart with faith and thanksgiving. The body of Christ for the people. The blood of Christ for the forgiveness of sins. We take and we drink. The blood of Christ for the forgiveness. Have the new covenant in the blood of Jesus shed for you. Take and drink. Remember Christ in your heart with faith. We thank you, Lord, that you have fed us in the sacrament, united us with Christ, and given us a foretaste of the heavenly banquet prepared for all who believe in him. Amen. We stand as we receive the benediction. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, and the 
fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen.